Hello. It's Wednesday at noon here in DC, and so I am welcoming you to the purple parlor of my home. My name is Ginger Gaines Sorelli. I'm the senior pastor at Boundary United Methodist Church. And pretty much every week, here we are. And I spend some time um, pondering things, a little unscripted pondering about stuff that's on my mind and in my heart. And I'm just going to give it a second. I think I'm told that I'm live, so I'm going to trust that it's happening. Um, let's see any, usually I get a little signal that somebody's there, um, but I don't see that yet. There we go. Um, so hello. Hello, hello, glad to see you. It's a beautiful day in DC um, on this Wednesday of Holy Week. And who I've got, uh, of course, you know, it's kind of a, a full week for pastors, clergy of all stripes. Well, I was reading something the other day that this is one of a, a rare occasion when almost all the major uh, faith traditions are uh, experiencing and celebrating, observing High Holy Days at the same time. So we're surrounded by many folk um, who are attending to the whole, some of the holiest of their days. And I'm thinking about all the various spiritual leaders in all those places and all the folks that are making it happen. Um, and I'm thinking about them with gratitude. What a gift and uh, that they offer and what a gift to be honored to be able to do the work. So welcome. Here is what is on my mind. I'm going to share, um, first of all, um, I went back, it popped up in my memories recently, last year's Facebook Live from the Wednesday of Holy Week. And I, I really focused last year on on more sort of theological, Christological ideas and thoughts about um, about Jesus. And so I, I want to share, I, I've just asked Brian to share that again in case you'd like, in case you missed it. Um, I think there's some stuff that's pretty important. I asked the question, what was Jesus doing between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? And really kind of focus on the question of you know, what was the point of Jesus' life? And what does our theology teach? And what is some of the theology that I think may be a little problematic? Um, so anyway, if you're interested in that, you can take a look at some point. Um, it's on our YouTube page, but I think Brian has the link and I'll share it. What is most forefront in my brain today is something different. Um, yesterday or day before, I saw the news that Governor Brian Kemp in Georgia had signed into law um, a bill that eases it. Well, it takes away the need for a license for guns um, to carry a, a weapon and background checks, of course, were part of the licensing process. And uh, as I read more about it, I saw that licensed gun dealers have to require background checks, supposedly, and so maybe there's a background check somewhere. But what I'm, what I'm, I, the idea here and the the rhetoric surrounding surrounding the political um, decision and action was that this was an act to make it easier for citizens to protect themselves. And that it's a constitutional right and not up to the states. Of course, these, I, I think, my sense is, is that some of the folk saying this are the folks that want to make all the decisions pretty much state-based um, so that they can control stuff more. But in this case, they're saying, no, this is the Constitution. Um, and the states shouldn't interfere in what we've already been given in the Constitution. Well, um, you know, I'm not, here, here's, <laughs> I have some pretty strong feelings about the proliferation of um, 
guns and I know that the all the data shows that in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and the um, uh, all of the violence um, racist violence that was happening over the last two uh, yeah, so two years um, that people have been buying guns at an alarming rate across the country. I, the, the data has been pretty clear that people are, people are packing. And uh, a lot of folks that had not owned guns before are going to buy guns. And the idea, I just, I, I personally, I have kind of this, I'm not against people owning guns. I think that there are very common sense things that can be done um, to create greater safety. Um, and bef uh, yeah, and so the, my, ba my general sense about this is that proliferation of guns, getting more guns out in circulation, does not make people safer, generally. It means that there are more guns available um, that can be used to do harm. Now, the other piece is, is that the kind of guns that get bought and sold um, are, of course, I'm not, we're not just, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, hunting rifles or things like that, um, though, of course, those are out there too, um, but I'm talking about these crazy guns that can kill, you know, uh, shoot hundreds of rounds in seconds. And I keep thinking, why does a citizen, I mean, these are just thoughts, these are just questions that I have, Somebody might have a great answer. But my, one of the questions I have is, why do citizens need to have a weapon that could take out an entire crowd within seconds or minutes? How is that protecting themselves or their family? Um, and I know that those guns are bought and sold. Um, anyway, so I, I just, I, you know, I have a real, I kind of have an, a, an issue with this idea that more guns creates more safety. Now, I, I understand that there are concerns that if only some people have the guns and other people don't have the guns, but then I just keep thinking to myself, it's like, again, like, okay, so everybody has guns. What does that mean? That just means more death. That means more destruction. That means more violence. I mean, it just, it seems sort of like A plus B equals C, which is not often the way I think, but in this case, it seems really clear. But the thing is, is I'm not just like having feelings about this. This is something that I think we have to grapple with as people of faith. And in this Holy Week, one of the, one of the stories that we hear as Jesus moves through the week, um, not only do we know on Palm Sunday that there was this, this real, um, uh, juxtaposition between the sort of military power and military might show of force um, of Roman imperial leadership and you know and and the ways that that, that colonialism sort of expressed itself um, by use of force and and this Pontius Pilate riding in with all the cavalry and whatnot and then you've got Jesus coming in to fulfill a prophecy about cutting off the war horse, of coming in humble and riding not on a, a you know, a, a cavalry steed, but on the coal, on a, a foal of a donkey, a colt. Um, it, there's a juxtaposition here. When, when Jesus, who's been in the temple for days during, whole, during these days that we're walking through right now, or journeying through right now, um, Jesus was in the temple, there was plotting going on, but Jesus was just teaching and doing what Jesus does. And then in the garden, of course, once the, they knew where Jesus was and they had their plan together, they showed up and, as we know, um, Peter took out a sword, and uh, at least in one of the accounts, and, um, and started going after one of the guards who was coming for Jesus, and Jesus called him back and then provided healing for the wound that had been inflicted. And this is, of course, consistent with the vision 
the prophetic vision that God has been sort of giving, speaking into the world for many, many centuries. And the very same words I discovered today, I don't think I ever knew this, but these very same words show up in both um, Isaiah chapter 2 and in Micah chapter 4. I'm going to read from Micah. This is chapter 4, starting in, the, in verse 1. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that God may teach us God's ways, and that we may walk in God's paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. This is, you know, a really challenging, and we talked about loving enemies last week and the whole issue of war and violence and what we do, you know. So the issue of violence is, um, is I just, I think, just one of the absolutely most complicated, in some ways, and really clear things that we have to grapple with as people of faith. And... Um, I mean, and, and the vision is clear, to, to, to turn the weapons of destruction into tools of cultivation of those things that sustain life rather than take life, um, the things that help till the earth and uh, create gardens that can feed people instead of metals used to harm people. and. You know, it seems, it seems absurd in our world because we're so infused by, by weapons um, to think that it could ever not be that way. <laughs> I had this, mm, well, let me share this first before I go to my, my sort of ridiculous vision. Um, there is an organization that I learned about years ago in an at an event at Riverside Church in New York City called God and Guns. Um, and it's called Every Town for Gun Safety. And uh, again, Brian has the link to the website. It's, it's an extraordinarily helpful organization and resource around the issue of gun violence. Um, over a hundred people in the United States are killed every day by guns. Uh, they have all this research and and data, which is just helpful. You know, I mean, data is data. Information is is helpful. And their mission is not, you know, that no one should have guns. It's that we should have um, common sense gun legislation that creates greater safety. And I think I've said it in this space, I will say it again, the idea that someone is going to get, that a parent is going to get upset about um, their child being taught things that actually happened in our history in America. And they get really upset about that and they go to the, to the school board and they raise a ruckus and they, you know, do all sorts of things and are just seething with anger about that. And yet they would support the idea that um, folks can purchase a gun and carry a gun without a license and that it's perfectly legal and that those persons can walk into any space um, that, you know, again, their child might get a hold of that and get it into a school um, and that the kids could, and as we have seen again and again and again and again, kids will be killed because of this stuff. 
And here's the other thing, is that this idea of um, the, the fact that you've got different states with different laws is another thing that I was learning on the, on the site as I was looking again just to make sure I was up to date on my, on my info. Um, the fact that the states have different laws means that um, if you've got states that where things are more lax, then that creates a greater, you know, a greater opportunity for gun trafficking, which of course is huge business, all of anywhere you can make the money. Um, and so the the when, when the the uh, authorities will track guns that have been used in crimes, and when they track them, they find that a lot of these have crossed over state lines because they're coming from places where it's much easier to get your hand your hands on guns. So gun legislation in places matters. And people can say all the things they want to say about about it, but there are things like, um, I learned this thing. You know, if you buy a gun, there's a way, if you think we don't have this technology, I mean, we have the technology to do some of this stuff. If you purchase a gun, they can actually finger use your fingerprint, like we use our face to turn on our phone. You, they could use a fingerprint so that if it's your gun, the only way you can use that gun is if it's your fingerprint that's that's that's, you, you know, turn, turning it on or whatever you do with a gun. Um, and doesn't that sort of make sense? I mean, if you're going to try to traffic these things, it's going to make it harder. I'm not saying it's in, in, not impossible, you know, that it's not possible to be able to still somebody else use the gun. But if you can program it, basically, to only be used by the person who holds the license, then that is at least one other step that someone's going to have to go to to try to get it into someone else's hands. And it also would mean that your children, if you have children, aren't going to be able to use it. I'm just saying there are things that could be done and should be, frankly. Um, as people of faith, I think the very least we can do is say we need to have common sense gun laws and we need to figure out ways to not keep proliferating and making it easier for more guns to get out in circulation. So um, that's been on my mind. The other thing is, of course, we recently had this shooting in Brooklyn on the subway. It, uh, it dawned on me as I was reading that story that uh, the train, I could have been on that train um, 12 years ago or mm, 13 years ago when I lived in New York because I would take, uh, I worked in uh, on the Upper East Side and I would take the train, I would then get on the, the N and I would transfer over to the R. So if you're reading any of those stories and it says, oh, they got out um, at 36th, I think it's 36th, um, and crossed over onto the R train after the shooting happened, that's what I used to do daily. Um, and it just, you know, I just think about, about, about that. This, you know, people are getting shot by, I mean, I hear gunshots in the neighborhood all the time here in D.C. And I live in a pretty stable, you know, I mean, it's all over the city, all over the city. So I think it's something we have to grapple with, and um, a lot of people are being hurt by it. So I had this vision, this crazy vision. It occurred to me today, and I thought, wow, is even, I mean, do I even say it out loud? Can you imagine, ima just try to imagine for a minute a world where there were no guns? Oh, just first of all, just that. <laughs> um, no guns. I mean, I can hear my family that hunt saying, but, 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 and I, I mean, I'm, I just want us to play with the idea for a minute. Or at least not weapons, guns that are not made just for the purpose of hunting. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that if we have little devices that could shoot some kind of uh, um, oh, what's it called? When it's some drug that paralyzes you? <laughs> like, like a dart. <laughs> People think I'm nuts. But I, I think about these things. I'm like, how can we stop someone who's doing something bad and we can't get right to them without killing them? I just, I don't believe that we can't figure out how to do that. I just don't believe it. I think that if we wanted to, we would. I just think that we like having things that are we, the broad we, 
Um, it makes us feel powerful to be able to hurt people. I don't... Anyway, I, I think these are things we have to grapple with. I'm, I'm fairly passionate about it. Maybe that's obvious. Um, what would happen if the energy that went into all of this business around guns and violence... And I, I'm not even going to touch bombs and nuclear weapons or any of that right now because I just... Well, I just can't. Um, but I think, I think sometimes about what would happen, and not just in this issue, but certainly in this issue, what would happen if we put all of the energy that goes into creating destruction into, as the scripture calls us to do, into creating things, as Jesus said in our scripture, um, this past Sunday for Palm Sunday, the things that make for peace. Why don't we focus on the things that make for peace instead of the things that make for war? And I know it's because we're fearful and we think, well, if, if we let up, then everybody, then they'll just come for us and we won't be able to protect ourselves. I understand all of those, those things. I'm talking about, I'm talking about, you know, like the fulfillment of the kingdom of God on earth, when God's, God's reign comes on earth as it is in heaven. And this, this prophecy is fulfilled where nation shall not lift up a sword against nation and they shall learn, they shall not learn war anymore. That, that is, that is what I, I wish we could just, just do. <laughs> Everyone just laid their stuff down. Anyway, um, just things for us to ponder. Um, I think mm, I think I'll I think I'll end there on that. I think that's what I got. <laughs> I think that's what I've got. I think Jesus calls us uh, to peace, and it's called the Prince of Peace for all sorts of reasons, and not just our own sort of when we're sitting alone and meditating and all's going our way, peace, I'm talking about like peace, peace, like put down the weapons and create things that give life. Um, okay, I have some announcements, <laughs> uh, some reminders. I hope many of you already know some of these things. Um, this week we have Holy Week services, so tomorrow evening at 7 we'll have our Monday Thursday service. It's hybrid, so you can join us online, um, you can join us in person. In person will be, um, uh, well, it, you're either going to need to have communion elements and some water, um, or you'll be able to receive the elements and have your feet or hands washed if you'd like to do that piece um, at the service tomorrow evening, and Pastor Will is bringing the meditation for tomorrow. Um, beautiful music as always and on Friday there are two services I want to call your attention to at noon one is in person at Foundry I'll be doing a meditation um, simple service probably about 45 minutes and Asbury United Methodist Church our sibling congregation it has a uh, an online seven last words service which begins I think at noon and um, so I commend that to you I'm doing one of the one of the meditations for that service um, and then on Friday night, a super, super special um, experience that many of our folks at Foundry have been working on, lay and clergy and staff have been working on. And it's a sort of multi-sensory musical drama um, offering of the story of the Passion of Jesus and includes scripture reading and anthems and solos and um, monologues that kind of capture the different some of the characters in the story. Um, I think it's going to be really, really special. So I hope if you're in town, you join us on Friday evening, that's at 7, um, or join us online. And Saturday, Easter egg hunt, if you can, if you have little ones, bring your little ones. If you can come and help, that would be really great. You can register for that on our website. Um, also on Saturday morning, we'll be uh, doing decorating in the sanctuary. So if you can help with that, that would also be super helpful. And registering is, is helpful too for our planning. And then Sunday, we have 9 and 11.15 for Easter. 
both services will be very much similar, maybe a couple of different music choices, but pretty much same service. If you can come early, that would be great, just in case we have lots of folks show up at 11.15. We want to make sure we are able to practice radical hospitality. And I know that's a lot, but there you go. Um, the, that, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I, hope, I hope we'll get to celebrate and observe these holy days together. Let's pray. Loving God for the beauty of this day, for your grace as we travel this holy week, for your presence with us as we seek to keep watch with Jesus in these days. We give you thanks and praise. I pray your blessing upon all of those victims of violence, uh, both near and far. I pray that you would help us as those who seek to follow you and live according to your wisdom and way, that we might uh, give our energy and attention to the things that make for peace and that cultivate life. And I pray, O oh God, that you would continue uh, to help us do whatever it is we need to do so that your promise of resurrection and new life might spring forth in our hearts and through our lives for others. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me. May the peace of God be with you. And may you know in the very core of your being the liberating power of God's love. I'll see you on the other side of Easter. <laughs>